Virtual Legality is a YouTube video series with audio podcast versions presented as commentary and for education and entertainment purposes only. It does not constitute legal advice and does not create an attorney-client relationship. If you have legal questions about the topics discussed, please consult your own legal counsel. Honestly, you don't want to be taking generic legal advice from a YouTube channel or podcast in any event. On with the show. Hello and welcome to another Virtual Legality. I'm your host, Richard Hogue, managing partner of the Hogue Law Business Law Firm of Northville, Michigan, and today we're taking requests on Virtual Legality. I received a message from a Twitter follower of mine the other day that asked me the following question. Hey Hogue, have you read about the Native American Nation Casino that is suing Valve over loot boxes? They are claiming Valve is fostering illegal gambling while casinos are heavily regulated. Wanted to get your take. Possible Virtual Legality? I told him I hadn't seen it, but that I could potentially look into it. And he said he didn't know where the link was, but he heard it being discussed on the free to play cast. So I'm going to consider them as well as Damon Newell, who is uh, on Twitter at Damon Newell number one, as uh, the folks that had asked me to do this commentary on the pending case against Valve. And so without further ado, I did do some digging and I found some articles discussing it. So let's dive in. Uh, The main article that really opened up this this story is from GeekWire, and it's from April 12th, so just about a week ago, and it says Valve hit with illegal gambling lawsuit by Native American nation that operates a casino in Washington state. The article says a Native American nation that operates a casino in Washington state filed suit against Valve software accusing the gaming giant of fostering illegal gambling and benefiting from an environment of unfair competition with casinos that are heavily regulated by state and local governments. It goes on to describe the lawsuit, but since we're going to do that anyway, uh, we'll skip that description a a little bit. You see here at the end, they've got the link to the lawsuit, but I will, of course, be putting the link to the primary documents in the video, as I am wont to do, because I do always recommend, if you can get access to it, absolutely read the primary documents, rather than other persons or other individuals' uh, representations of what are in those documents, because you can get a better understanding of exactly what it is they say. But I do want to give credit for Uh, the source of the material, the the folks that put the article out there that even uh, made me aware of it, as well as the folks that mentioned it on Twitter. And that's GeekWire, so do check it out. I will link it in the description of this video. But let's take a look at the actual filing itself. So here we've got the the scribbed uh, copy of the filed document, which is filed as of April 3rd. So even then, it took about uh, 10 days for anyone to really notice it, which is the way things work with public filings. But it says the Quinault Indian Nation as the plaintiffs are suing the Valve Corporation uh, as as the defendant. And we're going to go through the recitals a bit here. It is as it's described in that GeekWire article. They are suing Valve essentially for violating the gambling laws of the state of Washington. I'm going to talk a little bit about what they say, whether or not it's gambling. I'm also going to talk a little bit about whether or not this lawsuit is likely to succeed. Now, when I talk about that, It is with the disclaimer that you saw at the front of this video or at the front of this podcast, which is this is all for information and education. I'm not representing anybody. I'm not representing certainly anybody in this case. And you shouldn't take it as legal advice. I am uh, barred. I am a member of the State Bar of Michigan. I'm not barred in the state of Washington. So everything I'm looking at here is essentially through general jurisprudential principles, general law principles, and not with a intimate understanding of Washington case law, Washington regulatory body, and things like that. If you wind up having a lawsuit or a case that you bring in another location, whether it's another country or another state, it's often advisable to get local counsel who is familiar with uh, the little minutia that differentiates different jurisdictions from one another. And, and that can go down to the county level as well as the state level. So I do recommend local counsel, but you can take a look at these things even from afar, even with a Michigan license and say, okay, I see a couple things here that maybe are problematic or that maybe do work. And we can look at the Washington statutes as we go along, which we'll be pulling up as part of this video. So their complaint is they say they are a federally recognized sovereign Indian nation, which is great. Uh, They own and operate an Indian gaming casino licensed by the state of Washington. So uh, if you look at the Gambling Act in Washington and many, many, many other states, you essentially have a proviso in those statutes, in those acts that allow the state to enter into compacts or treaties 
uh, with these Indian nation representatives to allow them to do certain things uh, that might otherwise violate uh, specific laws. In this case, gambling. Uh, and that's why you do see Native American and Indian, Indian casinos across the country because of the way these compacts work, because of the unique status uh, that the tribes have under United States federal law. So what they're saying is they entered into one of these compacts. They are running a casino in the state of Washington, and Valve is not. Valve is not licensed. They're not licensed as a gambling company. They are a video game company. They're a software development company. Uh, and so they're not licensed under the same rules and laws uh, that uh, this Indian nation is licensed under. And so when you start discussing that, their claim is basically that if they're not having to pay for the regulatory compliance, then they're illegally competing uh, with Quinault. Uh, and, and so that's really the, the nut of the claim here. But the question is, whether or not that's an actually legally actionable claim. That's always what happens when you see one of these lawsuits brought up, when you see a claim made. They can tell a pretty good story. This is only their end of the, the story, right? This isn't Valve's side of the story. And you can tell a pretty good story uh, if you get enough lawyers working on something, and you can, you can tell a story where you are damaged, where it looks bad, and that you want some recompense. You want somebody to fix it, to make you whole, to give you damages. Uh, because you've otherwise been harmed. And I think they do tell a decent story about how this is affecting them, how this is affecting their business. But I do have questions about its legal actionability, as we'll get to uh, in just a moment. So they go on to say, Valve facilitates illegal, unregulated, and unlicensed online gambling of skins in numerous ways. Uh, and these are the digital items in particular that relate to um, CSGO. And they are calling out, in particular, CSGO, because unlike some other loot boxes, you know, uh, like Overwatch, where you don't have the ability to sell to another party, Valve and CSGO has facilitated certain transfers of uh, the skins across accounts that allow the, this type of case to come up because it does have a certain amount of value. Once you can sell something in the market, it is much more difficult for somebody like Valve to claim that there isn't value associated with that digital product, even though the ESA and Valve and video game companies in general, regardless of whether there is a secondary market in these goods, would like to claim that the goods themselves are digital. They're ones and zeros. They don't have an inherent value. And that's what's been preventing the gambling laws from really being imposed on these video game companies. You can see a couple of videos in virtual legality where we discuss the nature of loot boxes how they're regulated, how they maybe should be regulated, whether or not there is an issue with federal gambling laws. This isn't brought up under federal gambling laws. This case is brought up under Washington state gambling laws, which is distinct as uh, all kind of discussions of laws are. You have to remember what jurisdiction you're in, what laws and what body of laws and rules and regulations are being applied. And in this case, we're talking about Washington state laws. So they go on to really describe the skins process here. They say, for instance, Valve sold to users a token called a key for $2.50, the only purpose of which was to allow users to engage in gambling through opening crates to win virtual items that were worth much more than the value of the token or to win virtual items with virtually no value. The look, feel, sound, and experience was basically an online slot machine as seen in the following YouTube videos. And they give examples of how these loot boxes worked. In addition, from August 2013 to July 2016, so that's a flag right there. They're talking about a time period from a couple years back, which indicates that something has changed since then. And we'll find out as they go through and they actually talk about what the fact pattern is, the nature of the facts that kind of cover this case, that something did in fact change since then. And what changed was that Valve wound up discussing it with the Washington Gaming Commission, which I view as a significant problem to a court case like this. But they obviously don't since they brought it. But they say since August 2013 through July 2016, the time period from when skins gambling began and before Valve took its first incomplete and ineffective steps to address skins gambling, Valve had actual knowledge of the identity of the Valve accounts that gambling websites used to effectuate gambling transactions and chose not to take any action against them. Uh, at all times relevant to this compl uh, complaint, Valve allowed gambling websites to use Valve accounts. Uh, it says Valve provided technical support, refused to use blacklists, essentially didn't perform adequate protective measures to prevent this gambling that they are saying took place on their website through these CSGO accounts that could transfer skins and that could sell them uh, in open markets. Uh, and if we take a look at the actual definition of gambling under, uh, gambling under the Washington Act, we see that they might have a point. Uh, in fact, in this particular instance where you have a secondary market, I think based on the language of the Washington Act, they probably have a pretty good point. 
The statute here describes gambling as used in the chapter as meaning staking or risking something of value that then goes through a contest of chance where you don't have a skill-based component on, a, on the agreement and understanding that they will receive something else of value in the event of a certain outcome. If you get all cherries, if you get a gold loot box, you'll get something back of value. And so you put the $2.50 key into the loot box. And if you get back a $100 uh, skin, as you can uh, attest to the value of on a secondary market, then I do think there's a reasonable case to be made that there's gambling occurring here under the laws of the state of Washington. The problem that you've got is there's a reasonable argument that that isn't happening, as the ESA has put forward, as Valve has put forward. When you're talking about digital goods, these laws weren't written to really accommodate the notion of non-monetary transactions or non, uh, non-goods-based non transactions. Even in casinos where you're using chips and things that have a direct corollary relationship to money, these don't. You're talking about a sec- essentially a luck-based marketplace that then uses a secondary marketplace to ascribe value to them. And that might be attenuated enough for Valve to get out from being having this activity being described as gambling. And so you've got this situation where reasonable minds can differ. And certainly the Washington Gaming Commission hasn't sued Valve, hasn't brought up a felony action against them for operating without a license, as far as I'm aware. They have looked into this. They have discussed this. That's going to come up as we go over this lawsuit. But the Washington Gaming Commission is the body charged with looking at these questions. They are the ones that get to decide what gambling is, essentially, in the state of Washington. And this lawsuit, in certain respects, tries to go around the horn, tries to say, okay, well, the Washington Gaming Commission isn't doing its job, so we're going to sue you directly uh, as you should be uh, legislated, you should be regulated, you should be paying licensing fees, you should be having to do the compliance that we have to do. And I don't think, one, that that's the way the statute is written. I don't think that there is an obvious avenue, just looking at it, again, as a Michigan lawyer and scanning through it in preparation for this video, I don't think there's an obvious avenue towards a civil action. When we talk about crimes, when we talk about a felony uh, like is described in the Washington Gaming Act, generally the way we think about it and the way we should properly think about it is if there's a violation of that, the state comes in and prosecutes it. It's the attorney general's office, or there's other names for those kinds of offices in various states that come in and say, you violated the law and the people of the state of Washington are going to sue you for violating the law. Not another civil actor is going to claim some kind of uh, competitive disadvantage because you violated the law, even if you absolutely did. And here we've got an even more confused situation because Valve actually has been talking with the Washington Gaming Commission and is not currently being told that they are under potential felony or arrest or anything like that because that conversation is ongoing. And this lawsuit is an attempt to essentially short circuit that as best as I can read, which is rather than lobbying the Washington Gaming Commission to uh, enforce licensing that they think Valve should have to have enforced against it, they've instead sued Valve as someone that has a duty to them in some respect. And it's a duty that I don't think they properly state in this complaint or, or claim. And so that's really the situation that we find ourselves in when we go over this. But they do have some good points about the amount of money that they spend. So they talk about facts here and they say, hey, we entered into a compact with the state. That compact requires us to do a lot of things. It requires us to hire certain types of security. It, it requires us to employ agents and auditors that help us comply with this big, long list of rules that the Washington Gaming Commission has put forth. And it says that the budget of our gaming agency, which is all devoted to compliance, has averaged $1.15 million over the last five years. We hire management and employees to comply with the law. We have to make sure we check IDs to make sure nobody under 18 comes in. We have to give 2% of our proceeds from our gaming operations to mitigation funds to reimburse various municipalities and states and locations. And then they say, we've spent since 2013 more than $1.2 million in regulatory fees and more than $300,000 to local governments. And Valve isn't doing any of that. Then they talk about how Valve increased in popularity from the start in 1999 to CSGO's release in 2012 and how they introduced skins in August of 2013 and how the marketplaces help facilitate Valve selling those skins, how loot boxes work, some things I think that in general folks that are watching a video like this or listening to a podcast like this are familiar with. But again, 
unlike other loot boxes, unlike Battlefront, unlike Overwatch, unlike some other things that we could talk about, this is kind of the worst case scenario for this discussion uh, in terms of regulation. When you do have that secondary, secondary market, when you can ascribe a value to the actual products that are popping out of those loot boxes or out of those backpacks or however you want to delineate it in your video game, you do have a problem with laws that are written broadly like the Washington law that talk just in general about whether or not value has been ascribed to what you're getting out of those boxes. Uh, it talks about Valve hiring e- economists. It talks about Valve essentially making sure that this marketplace worked to its maximum effect and tries to state that that's a, a negative, that they are well aware of what's happening here, that they're fine with it, that it looks and operates like gambling, and that the state of Washington should be interested in this because it's gambling. So this goes on and on and on. And as I said, I think we can short circuit it a little bit. One, because I think they've got a decent case that it's gambling, uh, but also because that doesn't end really the story for what it is that they're trying to claim and what they're trying to seek through the court system, uh, which is essentially a short circuiting of what the Washington Gaming Commission actually does, which is determine what is gambling in the state of Washington. Um, so we go on and on and on through here. And then we finally get to the counts. This is what they are actually claiming are uh, being violated by Valve. Uh, and so it says, uh, again, it repeats everything that it says above. That's normal for a case like this. It's normal for any kind of brief uh, or, or claim that you make in a court of law. Uh, it talks about Valve. And then it says that Valve is violating the Washington Consumer Protection Act. Uh, for unfair methods of competition or unfair or deceptive acts or practices in the conduct of any trade or commerce. So if we pull up that act in Washington, which is uh, an interesting one, it says civil actions. So civil action is when essentially for our purposes here, one company can sue another. You don't have to worry about an attorney general. You don't need to go through the state. This says in a private action in which an unfair or deceptive act or practice is alleged under this uh, section, a claimant may establish that the act or practice is injurious to the public interest because it violates a statute that contains a specific legislative uh, declaration of public interest impact. So I think broadly, that's what's happening here. They are trying to say there's a violation of this statute that contains a public interest impact provision, and we'll take a look at that right now. Uh, This is the legislative declaration section at the start of the gambling section of the Washington State Code, and it says it is hereby declared to be the policy of the legislature recognizing the close relationship between professional gambling and organized crime to restrain all persons from seeking profit from professional gambling activities in this state, to restrain all persons from patronizing such professional gambling activities, to safeguard the public against evils induced by common gamblers and common gambling houses engaged in professional gambling, and at the same time both to preserve the freedom of the press and to avoid restricting participation by individuals in activities and social pastimes, which activities and social pastimes are more for amusement rather than for profit, do not maliciously affect the public, and do not breach the peace." So there's a couple of other statements here that I didn't highlight, but it's a basically a, a, a thrust of a public safety argument. So I do think it complies with the basic requirement that we see in the Unfair Trade Practices Act uh, that says you can claim a violation from another party, another private entity, if you are claiming that what statute they're violating has a specific legislative declaration of public interest impact. So I do think that the Gambling Act uh, qualifies under uh, that particular provision, and it wouldn't surprise me if this has been adjudicated in Washington and other case law. As I said, it's a much longer process to research case law in these various jurisdictions, so it wouldn't surprise me if this question, whether the Gambling Act qualifies for treatment under this particular act, has been answered, and I certainly think, at least on a cursory examination, that it does. So, On that basis, they do have the ability to make a claim like this uh, as long as it's essentially targeted primarily at the impact that it makes against the public. You saw that in the the statute. And that doesn't really happen here, but that's not necessarily important for whether or not this gets kicked out of court because the overall thrust of what they're claiming seems to be accurate, which is that there are unfair or deceptive acts if they are allowed to be gambling when they shouldn't be uh, in violation of uh, the CPA and also potentially the Gambling Act. Uh, They go on to talk about the various ways the legislature has made it a public policy. Uh, And then they then they get to this part, which is really where I think uh, they lose the plot a little bit. And they certainly lost me when I was looking at this and and trying to uh, come up with what exactly was happening here and what to discuss on a video and podcast like this. 
And we get to number uh, 112 that says the Washington Gaming Commission charged that Valve was operating unregulated, unlicensed gaming. So the Washington Gaming Commission already came in on this subject, came in and talked to Valve and said, hey, this is a problem. You've got the secondary market. It's got this uh, ascription of value. And uh, that's probably gambling under our laws. What are you going to do about it? The claim goes on to say Valve took the position that the WGC did not regulate Valve and therefore had no authority to enforce illegal gambling law against it or to require it to make any business or technological, uh, technology practice changes, such as eliminating one-way trading to stop skins gambling. The WGC, the Washington Gaming Commission, ultimately worked with Valve to identify some websites where illegal game gambling was occurring, and Valve will take the minimum steps to stop specific gambling sites identified by WGC from operating. Again, we have a little editorializing there in a court briefing, which is that Valve will take the minimum steps. It will take the steps that the WGC is requiring of it, uh, and whether or not those are minimum or not is really a problem that Quinault has with the Washington Gaming Commission rather than Valve. Uh, it says, however, WGC did not review internal Valve documents, emails, or receive under oath testimony from Valve employees about skins gambling. And Valve's acts, omissions, and practices constitute immoral, unethical, oppressive, and unscrupulous business conduct that caused substantial injury to Quinault. So the actual state of affairs here, the facts, and it's to their credit that they put this in uh, the, the claim itself, because I think it speaks entirely against what it is that they're trying to achieve here, is a, a story in which the Washington Gaming Commission comes in, says, Valve, you might have a problem here. Valve says, gee, Washington Gaming Commission, we're not a casino. We don't think that you have jurisdiction here. But over the course of discussions with the WGC, and the WGC is interested saying, hey, if you don't do something about this, we are going to regulate you. We're going to require you to get a license. We're going to require you to comply with all these statutes, and we don't want to have a fight about it. So what are you going to do? Valve decided that they would take care of some of these uh, websites, and presumably from the fact pattern as described here, and I don't have an intimate familiarity with exactly what happened in respect to these discussions, though it seems likely that they took place in 2016, the WGC said, okay, that's good enough, Valve. We don't think you're gambling anymore. We're not looking to have you get a license. We're not looking to uh, bring a criminal action for a felony conviction against you. We think you're okay. And essentially, Quinault is saying in this lawsuit, the WGC is wrong. Uh, they should have enforced something more against Valve. They didn't look at documents. They didn't get under oath testimony. They didn't do what it is they're supposed to do. And we were harmed by that. So I look at this and say, okay, well, maybe you have a lawsuit, Quinault, against the WGC if you think they're not fulfilling their statutory obligations, that they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing under the law. I don't think you have a claim based on this fact pattern against Valve. This would be the equivalent of getting pulled over on the highway going 75 miles an hour and saying, well, the guy next to me was going 90 and the, the cop's saying, well, I didn't arrest him. I'm arresting you or I'm, I'm giving you a citation or a ticket. And then you going back home and deciding to sue the guy who went 90 whose license plate that you got because he otherwise made it more difficult for you to get to work and he committed all these crimes against you uh, because he should have known better. That's not the way the world works. Uh, if Valve is communicating with the WGC and the WGC decides that Valve is okay, that they're not engaged in gambling, it's really not the purview of Quinault or really any other personal actor in Washington, as best I can tell from the statutes, to bring a civil claim of violation under the Gambling Act. As a matter of fact, we see here in the gambling uh, statutes in Washington that when it describes the Gambling Commission powers and duties, it talks about licensure. It talks about all the things that can be ascribed uh, to the various things that the Gambling Commission can do. It says it can prescribe the manner and method of payment of taxes, fees, and penalties to be paid to or collected by the commission, uh, which means it can decide on exactly how much that's going to be or how little that's going to be. And more importantly, it can decide to regulate and establish the type and scope of and manner of conducting the gambling activities authorized by this chapter, including but not limited to the extent of wager money or other thing of value which may be wagered or contributed or won by a player in any such activities. Which is to say, the Gambling Commission here has the entire authority over what is and isn't gambling in the state of Washington. And if they had never talked to Valve, I think there would be a stronger case for Quinault to make that Valve is operating as a gambling entity and the commission just never noticed them. Now, that should probably take the form of a phone call or a letter to the gambling commission or to your congressman or to whoever else it is that might control your relationship with the state of Washington's government. But I suspect those conversations happened. When you have a, a fact pattern like this, I suspect when this happened in 2016, Quinault got very angry that the WGC didn't do anything more to Valve 
And they looked at this and said, all right, well, maybe there's some way we can sue them. They got some lawyers that said, okay, let's try this Consumer Protection Act lawsuit. And then let's throw a couple of other things uh, on here as well. And, and so one of the things we see here is tortious interference with contract, which as best I can tell, doesn't work at all. Uh, but the claim here is that Quinault has a contract with the state of Washington in the form of the compact, which provides legal right to engage in regulated gaming, and that Valve maliciously interfered with Quinault's rights under the, uh, under the compact by operating and or facilitating illegal online gambling in Washington without a license, regulation, paying any fees or taxes to the state of Washington or otherwise complying with Washington law. The problem uh, here is that it doesn't appear like that's what tortious interference is in the state of Washington. So one thing I like to do when I'm looking at crimes and cases in other states is I like to look at their jury instructions because those are a good way to see the law broken down. So I highly recommend it if you're a law student or if you're otherwise interested in this and you're wondering what the elements of an action might be uh, in a various state or you're reading a news article about those kinds of things, go and see if you can't find a publication of the jury instructions for the crime that's being discussed, that you're trying to figure out what it actually is. And here we've got the jury instructions for tortious interference with contract. Uh, and we see what you have to prove to make a tortious interference with contract claim. That at the time of the conduct at issue, name of plaintiff, uh, so that's the Quinault uh, nation, was a party to a valid contract with the name of breaching party to state purchase, uh, purpose of contract. So this is basically, this would say that the time of conduct at issue, Quinault was a party to a valid contract with the state of Washington to facilitate gambling on Quinault property. That Valve knew of the existence of that contract. And then here's the, here's the key, that Valve intentionally induced or caused the state of Washington to breach that contract with Quinault. And that's not even attested to in the fact pattern. You don't have a tortious interference claim here because Valve isn't otherwise interacting with your relationship, if you're Quinault, with the state of Washington. It's doing its own thing over here. You don't like it. You think it's not competing in a fair way. And that's fine. You might well be getting damaged by the WGC having too close of a tie to Valve, to not doing its job, to acting arbitrarily and capriciously. But you don't necessarily have a tortious interference claim. Tortious interference being one of those things that is just generally tacked on to commercial transaction claims like this one. But I did want to look at the jury instructions because I don't want to speak out of turn. And I looked at those and I said, well, you're not instituting a situation where Valve is impacting your contract with the state of Washington at all. And you're not even really trying to claim the elements of it here in the lawsuit that you're making. So it's essentially what I might consider, a, it's a weak spitball that you throw at the wall and see if it sticks and see if a judge can go for it. And that's a similar thing to what happens here with the third count which is the only, uh, which is the last count here. They've got the first count, which is really about the Consumer Protection Act. You've got the second count, which is tortious interference with contract. And you've got the third count here, which is negligence. The problem here is that a negligence action requires a duty. Uh, you can't be negligent just on your own, doing your own thing and not, not meeting your own requirements for care. You have to have had a duty of some kind to another party. And so what you see here is that they say defendant valve at all times relevant to this complaint owed Quinault a duty to use reasonable care to prevent illegal unlicensed gambling to occur on valve servers and premises in a way that unfairly competed with Quinault. So you've got two problems there. The first problem is you don't have that duty. At least it's not established. There's nothing that they recite here. There's no law that they claim would put a duty between Valve and Quinault. They're completely independent actors. You don't have a duty to everyone in the world when you're just out there operating in the world. And so you've got a situation where I don't think there is that duty. This is just another claim that they're trying to make to help bulk up their claim uh, and make it more uh, relevant and more possible to get the, the declaratory relief that you see in count four there. Uh, to happen, to get the judge to give them what they're looking for. The other problem is, is that this continues down a path where they talk about unlicensed gambling. And as part of the facts that they've actually already recited, you've got uh, the Washington Gaming Commission coming in and basically tacitly saying that gambling isn't occurring, at least so far, because the conversations they had with Valve haven't resulted in anything that has been indicated in this fact pattern, in the recitals here or elsewhere, that would indicate that the Washington Gaming Commission is seeking to have them licensed, to seeking to have uh, greater control put over Valve. And maybe they are, and maybe they aren't, but it's not stated here. And to the extent that Valve is otherwise complying with the conversations that they're having with the Washington Gaming Commission, who has the exclusive authority to license gambling in Washington, it's hard to say that they are not complying with the gambling laws. If they're talking with the commission, if they're honoring what the commission requests, it's, it's difficult to see how it's unlicensed gambling uh, under the laws of the state of Washington. So they've got that as kind of a two-pronged problem with the negligence claim. 
And then what they're actually seeking is injunctive relief. They're not seeking damages, which I thought was interesting. They're, they're seeking to have Valve be forced to stop using their, what they call, crate opening online slot machine game until the Washington Gaming Commission can examine it to determine if it requires a license. So what you're seeing here is essentially an attempt by Quinault to force the Washington Gaming Commission to look into whether Valve should have a license for gambling. I believe probably because they don't view the Washington Gaming Commission as having moved with the proper amount of alacrity, with the speediness required to get them whatever kind of relief they're seeking, and they have got a problem with that. Uh, and so that's really the entire run through of the court case. I found it interesting because you don't really see a civil action like this very often. It's an unusual kind of fact pattern, which is what attracted me to discussing this on virtual legality in the first place. But it is the kind of court case that I think is more designed essentially for press to pick it up and to look at and to discuss and try to raise the profile of what the Quinault Nation sees as a problematic set of activities from Valve. They're trying to get the Gaming Commission to listen to them uh, when I suspect they've had their phone calls not returned or the Gaming Commission not acting on it because Valve is a taxpayer in the state of Washington, is a big player, and they think that the Washington Gaming Commission just isn't interested in enforcing their rules against Valve when they otherwise should. Unfortunately, this isn't really the way it works. The proper way is to lobby your legislature to have things change to directly uh, affect Valve, to lobby the Washington Gaming Commission to discuss uh, licensing with Valve. It doesn't really make a lot of sense to sue Valve for what appears on its face to be compliance with the gambling laws of Washington, with the Gaming Commission's requirements, even if you don't like them. Uh, but hey, they might have some success. As I always tell my clients, you never know what a judge is going to do. You certainly don't know what a jury is going to do if it ever got to that point in time. And so sometimes it makes sense if the money is is high enough, if the value is high enough, and you've got lawyers that are willing to, to put a case together for you to proceed with it, to look at maybe uh, making the point that you're trying to make, maybe making it more public and more uh, known to folks that Valve did this with the CSGO skins, that the Washington Gaming Commission is falling down on the job, that there is a value in that publicity, even if you don't have a necessarily great chance of winning that court case. And I strongly suspect Valve is going to come back with a with a good counterpunch. It's probably going to get kicked out of court, would be my guess. Uh, but if it doesn't, then you've got discovery. You've got a chance to look through those emails to get folks talking under oath, which is what Quinault wants from Valve. Uh, and maybe you have that success and maybe you get a settlement that makes you a little bit happier at the end of the day. That's been Virtual Legality today. Thank you so much for watching. If you're watching this on YouTube, please do share this around if you find anybody that you think might be interested in it. I did uh, enjoy getting that tweet uh, earlier that talked about whether or not I could look at this on Virtual Legality. So if you have any other ideas for Virtual Legality, I'm always looking for concepts and for things to discuss, please feel free to tweet me. That's probably the best place to reach me, at Hogue Law on Twitter. Uh, and otherwise, if you're listening to this on a podcast, thank you so much for listening. Please uh, review it on the, your favorite service. I love getting those reviews. I love getting the shared engagements. Please comment and tell me I'm an idiot or tell me that you think my analysis was a good one. Uh, otherwise, I will catch you on the very next Virtual Legality.